Well, can I give you a very warm welcome to our service this evening? And it is such a, a beautiful evening tonight. And um, uh, looking forward even to even the time of fellowship as well. So don't forget to uh, not to rush away tonight. Uh, we have a cup of tea and coffee after the service. And it'll be a good opportunity to have a time of fellowship together. And just one other announcement in addition this morning. Um, we have some leaflets for the Bangor, Bangor Easter Convention. So some of these, there's a handful of them sitting down at the back as well. Uh, I mean, obviously on, on Friday and Sunday, you're going to be occupied obviously here. But Monday and Tuesday, just to let you know what's happening there, there's, uh, there's three speakers uh, this year. Joe uh, Barnard, who is from Holyrood Evangelical Church in Edinburgh, and also Paul Mallard and Whittacombe Baptist Church in Bath. Uh, I've heard Paul Mallard's excellent. And also um, Robert Murdoch um, as well too, who... Uh, as, as pastored many churches as well. So um, I encourage you also to think about that even on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, just uh, the, So plenty of these leaflets still available, the Bangor Easter Convention, an excellent ministry at those two. But let's, before we come together to, to sing, let's pray together and ask for God's help and blessing upon our service together tonight. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, even for the measure of health and strength that you've given us to gather here tonight. Lord, we do pray for those who are housebound at the moment. Um, Lord, we ask that you would look after and care for them, draw near to them. Even as they watch these own services online, may they be helped and encouraged even by them. Lord, we do also pray for, for Nancy, who's not too well at the moment. Lord, continue to help and strengthen her. And Father, we want to give thanks, Lord, even for how you're, you're strengthening Hannah as well. Lord, continue just to, to help her. And we pray for her, Lord, and just uh, even as she, she looks after the, the twins as well. And Father, we, we do ask, Lord, uh, for, for others even who may watch this service tonight, maybe who aren't members of our church, Lord, that as they will watch this service, Lord, they may even think about maybe even coming along as well too. And Father, as we've looked even at Matthew's gospel, Lord, we see how, uh, what a wonderful saviour Jesus is, how he is the compassionate saviour. But also as we learn of the mission, the mission of Jesus, Lord, not in proclaiming the message of the kingdom, may it also challenge our hearts as well tonight. Father, we do pray, Lord, even uh, not just for a time of fellowship together uh, later on, but also, Lord, even as we fellowship together around your word, and even sing these lovely hymns as well. And so, Father, may they even speak to our hearts tonight. And once again, we ask that as we come here, we, not, we come here not just to meet with one another, but, Father, to meet with, with you as well. And may we do that as we meet around your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin with some choruses tonight, uh, just a few choruses. And some, some of these are actually ones I haven't heard in a while. Whenever you hear that, sometimes you get a bit, you know, uh, panic and you hope people are going to remember them okay, but I think as well. These are all fairly well known. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, one uh, chorus, which is it's our desire that Jesus would take the highest honor, that he's the one who deserves all honor, blessing, and power. We'll just stay seated as we sing this. Jesus shall take the highest honor.
Jesus would be exalted. And our next little course reminds us of some of the blessings even that we have in Jesus, that in Christ we're reconciled to him, we are justified, and it explains how each of these comes about even through faith. But it also reminds us in the final chorus of our responsibility to magnify and declare the greatness of our Savior. This is reconciled, I'm reconciled to God forever. we were looking at last week was also the challenge that was given the disciples the challenge of to pray for more laborers but not only that they also had to respond themselves too and when we pray even about the work of mission as well we also the mission and evangelism we have to be willing also to be part of the answer even to that prayer as well and our next chorus challenges about that same calling are we available for god to use this is here i am wholly available
was near leaving me hanging there in the last bit. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a solo starting it off there. But... Well, let's turn to God's Word just now, and then we're going to sing one further, heaven just after that. We're turning to Matthew's Gospel once again, to Matthew chapter 10. And we just finished uh, on verse 4 of this uh, chapter last week. So last week we began a new section of Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew, after sharing with us of something of Jesus' authority and power, and in many ways that was a theme over the last number of chapters, of Jesus' authority and power, and he showed us then how at the end of chapter 9, he also bestowed some of the authority even to heal with his disciples. And he firstly, he told them also then to, to pray for the Lord of the harvest for more laborers. But also, straight after that, is when he sent the, 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 the 12 disciples out. So in many ways, they were being an answer to that, that prayer, even that they prayed before. But tonight, we find out exactly about the mission that he sent them out to do. And as we look at the instructions which Jesus gave the 12, we can also learn something as followers of Christ, even from these instructions today. So let's read Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. And God's word says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You have received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver, or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from off your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his word. You know, the disciples had to trust in the Lord even to guide them. And our next hymn that we're going to sing reminds us of the Lord, also how he leads us. And also how he provides for us a long life's journey too. And we'll stand as we sing this just to change our positions. All the way my Saviour leads me. What have I to ask beside?
Let's have a brief word of prayer as we ask for God's help as we proclaim his word. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you do lead us in life. How you lead and guide us, Lord, even through your word. And how your Holy Spirit uses that word to even just steer us in our life. To show us, Lord, even how you wish us to live. How you wish us to live even with with one another. And how you wish us even to relate to this world around us as well, too. And Father, we... As we look at this passage tonight about the mission that the disciples were were called on, Lord, may it challenge us to also about even the the task before us as well. And so, Father, once more as we see of the wonderful Saviour, may it cause us to, to worship you and to give praise to you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please turn to Matthew 10 once again. And, you know, the disciples were given a great responsibility, weren't they? To proclaim the gospel of Jesus, the message of the kingdom of God. Yet, as we said last week, to someone on a missionary committee, these people may not have seemed like a first choice. We maybe wouldn't have chosen them as our first choice. People who were fishermen, a tax collector, a revolutionary even. It doesn't seem like an ideal bunch of people you would choose to go into a particular mission scenario. Yet these were the people who God chose. And God used their abilities. He used even, uh, as we said before about Matthew, the tax collector, the one who was well used to keeping careful records. Well, he was the one who used them to write this gospel. Matthew's careful record keeping even paid off and, and recording this wonderful account of the life of Jesus. Even the fishermen as well, the the sort of the boldness of Peter. The Lord even used that as well too, because Peter would become the one who would often be like the, the spokesman for the group often as well too. You know, Jesus chose these men for a purpose, and God was going to use them to accomplish that purpose. Yet how were they going to fulfill that calling that they were to do? Where were they to go? What were they to do? This is what the passage tonight is all about and the first thing that Jesus instructs them is is where they were to go where they were to go see Jesus sent the 12 out but yet he told them maybe it might seem to us a strange instruction to not go among the Gentiles and don't enter the Samaritan towns but he says go to the lost sheep of Israel you see Galilee that area where they were where, where they were ministering was surrounded on all sides by gentle Gentile sorry, territories Uh, Now, that wasn't meaning that Jesus didn't have any contact with Gentiles. That wasn't what that means at all. Because, in fact, remember, he reached out to, there was a Roman centurion who came to ask him to heal his servant. And Jesus certainly healed the man's servant as well. Also, when he he went across to to, uh, the the two demon-possessed men as well, that was likely also into a, a, a Gentile area. And that was where he healed the two demon-possessed men who who lived quite near where the pigs were as well. So that was largely a a Gentile area he went to there. So it's not that that Jesus has something against the Gentiles, not at all. So it must be something else. You know, as we know, of course, elsewhere in this gospel, Matthew is going to emphasize to us that the kingdom of heaven is going to include Gentiles as well. In fact, Matthew records the, the, the... that some of the very first visitors to see Jesus when he was born weren't Jews, but actually Gentile wise men from the, from the, the, the East. We know that they came along even later. Sorry, we know there were, there were Jewish there were shepherds as well, of course. But also, some of the early visitors were Gentiles. Some of those early visitors were the wise men from the East. So here we see, you know, that as the, 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 the Jewish shepherds would have come along, And as the Gentile wise men came along, Matthew's beginning to introduce us to this theme. That here, this mission, this gospel, isn't just for the Jews. It's for others too. Also, Matthew is careful in chapter 4 to make the link between Jesus and a prophecy about the uh, Messiah and how he would be a light not just to the Jews, but the Gentiles. Matthew brings that prophecy in in chapter 4 because he's emphasizing that's a a theme that's going to come through as well. That this message isn't just for a select group. Those shepherds may have came initially. 
the wise men also came too from the east. And then Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah would be the light to the Gentiles. Matthew brings that out here. But also, so, yeah, it might seem strange then that, that Matthew records this instruction of Jesus, where it seems to be Gentiles are excluded. So what's going on here? Well, something to remember here, when Jesus is sending these disciples out, he's sending them here on, this is, if you like, um, a short-term mission trip with a limited focus. This initial sending out is going to be to initially go out. It wasn't that Jesus was saying, away you go now and and don't come back. That's not what he was saying. This is a short-term mission here. Uh, He's giving them this command meant specifically for them and specifically for this occasion. How do we know that? Well, Jesus is going to tell them later at the end of this gospel that this message that they've been given is to go and make disciples of all nations. So it's not that Jesus was trying to say, you know, forever just bring the message to the Jews and forget about the Gentiles. No, the end of the gospel makes that very clear where Jesus says, go into all the world. Go make disciples of all nations. You see, the pattern of Jesus and also the apostles who followed as well was to go first to the house of Israel and then go to all. Paul would write in, in Romans 1 uh, verse uh, 16, and we, we spoke in these verses, Jenna, on Tuesday night a couple of weeks ago, uh, where he says, He's not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So this is a message which all need to hear. So Jesus is giving this instruction initially to these disciples. On this occasion, I only want you to go to these Jewish areas. Tell them the message first. He wanted them to hear that message, to to see that message, a message which was going to be a fulfillment of those prophecies which they'd been given long before. Now you see how it is, I think there's a little principle in this. See how important it is that we don't take scripture out of context. Imagine if someone just lifted those two verses in isolation. They might think to themselves, oh well, I'm only to reach out to Jewish people there. You need to take the whole of the, the gospel, the whole of the message, the whole context. And we would, we would see clearly that this message is one for all. But also, so Jesus tells these men where they're to go. But also he tells them what they were to do. As they were to go into these Jewish areas, they were to proclaim as they go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's the message they were to proclaim. And I want you to note that that message they were to proclaim is the same message that John the Baptist proclaimed in Matthew 3. It's the same message that Jesus proclaimed at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4. To repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, although Matthew doesn't include the word repent here, it's certainly supposed because it's only through repenting of sin, it's only through believing in Jesus that people can enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is urging his apostles really to to proclaim the same message that he's proclaiming. Proclaim that same message. The kingdom of heaven and the reign of God in the hearts and lives of men and women was going to assert itself even more powerfully now than before. Because with Jesus... God's Messiah was here on earth. God's chosen one, the king, was here on earth. So that that kingdom, in a sense, had now begun to arrive because the king had come. But Jesus also commands his disciples uh, who they were to go to. Look at verse 8. We see a list of those who they were to go to initially with this message. They were to go to those people who were in great need. Go to those people who were in great need. He was asking them to do something that he'd already begun to do. So David Platt in his uh, little book in Matthew's Gospel, he divides this instruction up in in short. And uh, if you're a big fan of alliteration, you're going to love this. So he tells them to go to the diseased, the sick, heal the sick. Go to the dying, raise the dead. Go to the despised. They were to cleanse the lepers. Because remember, the lepers were those considered unclean. They were those who were isolated because of this terrible affliction. So they go to the diseased, the dying, the despised, the demon-possessed. Those whose lives were most tainted by sin. Those whose lives were, were wrecked even by sin. So Jesus had given them the authority to, to heal the diseased, the dying, despised, and demon-possessed. 
He'd given them authority to do this. That was going to serve to even authenticate the, the message that they were going forth. That they were apostles sent by Jesus. The fact that he gave them power to do this. And, um, but there was also a danger to avoid here. As Jesus was sending his disciples out with this. Because remember as Jesus healed many, the crowds began to surround him. And remember we talked about this before. Some people weren't actually genuine followers of Jesus. Some were merely only curious. They wanted just to see another miracle. They'd become fascinated by these miracles that Jesus was doing. And some just wanted him to see a miracle for those reasons. And, and so crowds began to surround him with uh, sick friends and family members. So there could have been a danger as Jesus was sending these disciples out. That they could have lost track of their mission. Because their mission was not just simply to go heal people. Notice the priority there. Notice what comes, what comes first. It's proclaiming the good news of salvation. To proclaim the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the priority here when they're being sent out. It wasn't that they were being sent out to, to go and just simply heal. And also there could have been a danger in, you know, that maybe people who were maybe unscrupulous could try and sell their services as healers. Like Jesus' ministry, the goal in theirs was never the miracles in and of themselves. But their goal was to proclaim the gospel. The miracles authenticated certainly the truth of that message and the authority that Jesus had given them. But Jesus instead cautions them about something. He says, you received without pay, so give without pay. So in other words, when the message of the gospel first came to them, it came free of charge. Jesus didn't sort of come up to these people and say, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you the message of the gospel, but there's a price to that. No, he didn't say that. They'd received the message for free, so he was saying, don't charge for others to hear that message. You know, for them to turn around and say, you know, oh, you know, I'll tell you how to enter the kingdom of heaven, but it'll cost you. They weren't going to say that. That would have been offensive, an insult even to God himself, to Jesus and sending them out. Imagine if they'd have done that to others. You know, God is the one who makes this gift of salvation freely available. Freely available to all who receive it and believe it. And so Jesus tells them what to do. And before he, he placed a temporary restriction on where they were, uh, where they were to go. So we talked about that temporary restriction. They were only to go into these Jewish areas. But next, Jesus gives his disciples another temporary restriction in verses 9 to 10. But there's a lesson, a deeper lesson in this. He's teaching them who they were to depend on. Who they were to depend on. Jesus tells them not to acquire gold, silver or copper for their belts. Neither take a bag for your journey. Don't take an extra change of clothes, sandals or a staff. For the laborer deserves his food. I wonder what kind of person you are when you, you, you travel somewhere. Maybe you're someone who likes to travel light. Or maybe you're, you're like me, who whenever they go somewhere, thinks to themselves, you know, well, you know, what if it's a bit warmer? Well, I better pack something for that. Or what if it's going to be colder? Better pack some for that too. I'm the kind of person who likes to be prepared when I pack. Um, usually the, bag, the bag's packed well in advance before. I'm not a last minute type of person. But you, know, you maybe like to be prepared for all eventualities. But now Jesus says to these disciples, I don't want you to go out with lots of extra supplies. I don't want you to go out with lots of extra funds. I want you to rely on God. You see, his disciples, they were going into these areas and, and they might have been tempted to take extra money. So maybe they could get a nice place to stay. Or maybe they might have been tempted to bring an extra cloak. And that cloak certainly would have come in handy because maybe if they couldn't get a place to stay, well, they could use this a second cloak to keep them warm if they were, had to sleep outside. But how does what Jesus is saying here apply to today? This is not just simply packing advice for us when we go off on holidays. No, again, we need to ask ourselves, that, that is Jesus saying here that if, uh, if someone is a missionary and they're going away to another country, uh, for a lifetime of service, is Jesus saying, you know, just go out with the clothes that are on your back and you'll be okay? 
No, again, remember, this instruction was given to this group of disciples for this particular occasion. This was given on this occasion. And the reason why I say that is, in fact, in another instance of um, Jesus sending his disciples out, and if you, can turn your, if you want to turn your Bibles, uh, you can see this in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 35 to 38. So we see that in, uh, this is a, a different occasion here where Jesus is sending out his disciples. Luke 22, verse 35 to 38. So Jesus says to the disciples here, he says basically, when I sent you out before without money or supplies, did you, did you lack anything? You had no money bag or knapsack or sandals. Did you lack anything? That's talking about this occasion that we've read in Matthew's gospel. So when I sent you out before, before, back when Matthew's talking about here, did you lack anything when you didn't have these things? And his disciples said, no, we didn't lack, we lacked nothing. And then on this occasion, when they're sent out again, what does he tell them? He says, let one who has a money bag, then, then take it along with your knapsack. Let the one who doesn't have a sword, then sell your cloak and go buy one. So Jesus is giving this instruction here to his disciples in this instance. So if they see how that instruction that was given in Matthew 10 was not certainly a once for all instruction where he tells them to go out with, with nothing. That was a, an initial sending out to say to them, depend on the Lord, depend on God. The second time he sends them out, well, he says, remember the last time? Were you lacking anything then? But yet he says, now, well, go along prepared. But don't forget the lesson you learned there before. God was going to provide for these men on this journey. They were going to learn this lesson and they were, they, were, they were going to go out when they went out the next time with supplies. So it's not wrong to be supported on missions. It's very important to be supported in missions. Paul was one that we engaged on one occasion and uh, on other occasions in tent making. Uh, and also he did that part time and also ministered part time as well. On many other occasions, Paul was financially supported by other churches who were established. And he directs them even to provide for their, their teachers as well. Uh, and so he, Jesus says here, the laborer deserves his food. So he's teaching his disciples, really, the apostles shouldn't be greedy. Don't be greedy as well. There's some obligation in those, you see, who receive the good news. And Paul writes the same thing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.18. He says, of those who preach and teach, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Instead, what he's saying here to his disciples, don't take extra supplies, but whatever town you enter, find one who's worthy and stay on it. Stay in there till you depart. He's basically saying to his disciples, on this occasion, I want you to go out and rely on the hospitality, even of others. This was going to teach them an important lesson. An important lesson that they would learn that of God's provision, you see, what type of reception they would face. That's what we see next. What kind of reception they'd face in verses 11 to 15. Now, before we go any further, as I read, read verse 11, there was a question that came into my mind. And maybe it's coming into yours right now. What does Jesus mean by saying, find one who is worthy? Is Jesus saying to, to go into this town and find someone who you think deserves to hear the message of the gospel? That can't be what Jesus is saying because this message is one that all need to hear. But it's also when it says find one who's worthy, it's not meaning go find someone who's morally good or, or someone who appears religious. That's not what he's talking about. But rather it's referring to one who is, is willing and able to receive an apostle of Jesus in the kingdom. Find one who is welcoming to you. Find one who wants to hear what you have to say. When you think about it, they would have arrived in a new town or a new village. And as they went around that town or village, I'm sure they probably began maybe, if this was a place that hadn't been before, maybe they stood and they preached in the, the, uh, the street corner. Or maybe they went to the market or maybe they went to the square. Basically, they would go to a place where there was loads of people. If you were going into an area and you want to evangelize it, you would stand on a, on a street corner and, and, and preach. 
And as they, as you preach in the open air, here's the thing, when you do that, you face often very different kind of reactions from people. Sometimes you face apathy. Maybe there's people who just kind of look at you and stare or look at you a bit funny and then walk off. Then there's others who are curious. They might stop for a bit. You also might face opposition. There'll be those who won't like what you have to say. There'll be those who maybe try and interrupt you and, and, and shout you down. But there will be others who'll want to listen. Others who'll want to not only listen, but they'll want to hear more as well too. And those who it's talking about who are worthy or deserving to provide hospitality, it's, it's talking about those who, who are you know, eager to hear this message. You see, there were many Jews who were waiting for the consolation of Israel. They were waiting for the hope. They had the, the hope in, in the Messiah. They, they were waiting, eagerly waiting. They were praying for that Messiah to come. And so when these disciples would come proclaiming of the Messiah, when they would come proclaiming the message of the kingdom of heaven, there would be some within these areas who would welcome them. Some who were eager to, to hear what they had to say. And, and they would welcome the opportunity to, to lodge those who had been sent by God. This is who it's talking about. Those who are worthy. Those who are, want to actually welcome these people in. Because they want to hear more. You know, so hospitality was something that was very important in the early church. And, and actually in early cultures in general. Hospitality was particularly important in, in, in this culture, in, in ancient Near East culture, because travel wasn't easy. There was often a great distance between the next available inn. When you think about it, maybe our, uh, where we are even from the nearest sort of hotel or B&B, we wouldn't have to go too far before we'd find one. If I was to ask you, could you, you tell me of one? I'm sure you could list one or maybe even two or three right now. B&Bs and hotels, whatever. There's lots around us. But it wasn't like that in the time Matthew was writing. They couldn't just, Jesus couldn't just say to these disciples, I want you to go and, you know, maybe try the Premier Inn, you know, tonight. Or I want you to try and go to, you know, your local travel lodge or whatever it is. No, there were only very few inns as well. They would have had to rely on the hospitality, even of strangers as well too. And so Jesus tells them, when you find such a place that's, that's welcoming to you, make it your base. Stay there until you have to leave that town to the next one. Don't be saying, I'll, I'll stay there until, I'll stay in this house until a better option crops up. No, don't say that. He says, when you enter the house of such a person, greet it. Welcome it. And you know, what was the greeting? There was a traditional greeting in those days of, of peace uh, to you. And of course, what a fitting greeting, because the message of the gospel is one of peace. It's a message that proclaims the peace that Christ can bring. The peace that people need. Our world today is in great need of peace. But the peace that all men need is ultimately the peace between them and God. Between sinful man and a holy God. And these messengers were bringing news of that peace. The one who had come and the one who is the prince of peace. Then they would come and bring that blessing of peace upon it. But he says, for those who won't receive this, they won't receive a blessing then. In other words, for those who reject this message, there won't be a blessing for them. Do you know, in many ways, these disciples, they're going to represent Jesus in lots of ways because for those who reject Christ, they won't receive peace from God. It's only those who repent and believe will receive that peace and be reconciled to God. But for those who reject, instead of peace, there's judgment. Not all will welcome these messengers of the gospel. Jesus tells them, if anyone won't receive you or, or listen to your words, then, then shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. You see, there was a Jewish uh, custom or sign. Whenever they would have left a Gentile region, when a Jew would have walked into a Gentile region, and bear in mind in those days they wear long flowing robes, and, and often the dust would gather in the bottom of their clothes and on their, on their sandals. And, and so Jews often shook off the dust of their clothing and their sandals when they left that Gentile community. See, they thought to themselves they didn't want even the, the, the dust from that Gentile area polluting even the, the Jewish area. 
That's what they did. That's what this expression meant, to shake off the dust from your feet. It was basically saying they wanted nothing more to do with them as well. And here Jesus though applies this gesture as a, as a sign of judgment against them. He uses this as a vivid picture, a vivid image. Do you know in Acts 13 verse 51, Paul and Barnabas actually use this very gesture as well. When, whenever people stirred up persecution against them and drove them out of their district, instead of retaliating, they shook off the dust from their feet and went to Iconium instead. In other words, they had discharged their responsibility. They had shared the gospel with that area. They had tried to share the gospel. I'm not saying they walked into that area and when they got the first person that didn't listen, they thought, right, that's it, Barnum's, come on, here we go. That's not what they did. They were faithful, continued to proclaim that message. And it does take persistence. But there was continued opposition. There was repeated rejection. And so there came a time when they moved on to another area where there was people who would maybe listen. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. And you know, it takes great wisdom in, in that. I remember some years ago when I led a beach mission team to one particular area. And we didn't know at the time, but we were basically going to be the last team sent to that area. We were there as the kind of the test case to see was there, because the gospel opportunity it seemed in that area was was lessening. In other words, there uh, there was maybe only a smaller number of people coming out to the beaches to actually hear the gospel in that area. There was many other new holiday areas that had sprung up around there, and instead they were going to those places instead of this. And I found out later on that you know that they weren't going to go back there in the next year. And I found that hard. You know, there was a handful of people who needed to hear the gospel as well. But yet there was an area where there was, there was often opposition in the past. People had rejected in the past there. There was a hardness to the gospel in that area. Only a small number even of children and families were coming out to that area. But yet there was another area of opportunity about maybe another 10, 15 miles away where there were many, many families that needed reached. And I find that hard. I find that difficult. But yet how we need great wisdom, even when we witness. We need that witness, we need that wisdom to know when is even that time to, to say, right, we've reached out to that uh, particular um, area so many times. Maybe there is an area of opportunity elsewhere. That's not an easy decision. That's a, it requires God-given wisdom, isn't it? Because all need the message. All need the message. And yet Jesus said to these disciples, he was also telling these disciples to not get, I think, discouraged as well. To not give up. Because sometimes when we get difficult encounters, we can be tempted to go, that was rough, that's enough of that. You know, whenever we were handing out some of the, um, the, the magazines even last year, not everyone was you know, willing to take them. Some people were very welcome and some people longed to, wanted to take them and were very interested. But not everyone had a, conversations like that. Sometimes there were those uh, looking at you as if you had two heads and they thought, no, I don't want anything to do with that. But when we get something like that, we don't just give up. We go where there is op- other opportunity. Okay, maybe that person didn't want to accept it, but maybe their neighbor down the, down the, the next area will. But you know, Jesus here gives a solemn warning, even this. When he says to these disciples, like, don't get discouraged. But he says, you know, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that area or town. But then there's a sober warning in verse 15. And it is a sober warning against those who reject the gospel. He says, truly I say to you, it'll be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town who rejects the message that Jesus' disciples have brought to them. You know, the name Sodom and Gomorrah will forever be remembered for the great judgment that was poured out upon it because of the wickedness of the people. Jude 7 uh, talks about how these cities, the judgment that happened to these cities serves as an, an, an example, an ex- deterrent example to, uh, of, of by, you know, those who underwent a, a punishment of eternal fire. It talks about 
Jude 7 says, The two cities which indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serving as an, as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. He says, Remember what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he's warning here. It's foolish to ignore the warnings. These disciples have a great responsibility. They have a great responsibility. Here as they share this message. There is a responsibility in their part as they proclaim it, but there's a responsibility in those who hear, because they can either accept or reject. Notice as well there's no sitting in the fence here with this. There's either people either accept or reject. You know, it's foolish to ignore the warnings. Do you know when you, you, you come to the Gospels, actually, Jesus often talked more about hell than heaven. As you look at many of the references, actually you see this. Jesus speaks of hell as a place of eternal torment, a place of unquenchable fire, a place where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, a place of outer darkness. It's a place where there is no return from. Jesus knew of the reality of this place, hell, and so in his goodness, he was warning people of the danger. That's why he spoke so often about it. He wanted people to know of the great danger of, of rejecting this message. It's foolish to ignore the warnings. Just like it would be foolish of us if we were, were driving out onto a road where there was a, a notice that said the bridge is out ahead. It would be foolish of us to ignore the warning and keep on going. Yet why do many treat the warning of hell so lightly in our world around us today? You know, Satan wants people just to, to simply be busy with the things of this world that they don't think about eternal realities. Or Satan even uses the trick of deception to make people think that, you know, that somehow this isn't a real place. But yet it is. The Bible talks about it. Jesus talked about it often. Why? Because he wanted people to accept this message, not reject it. He warned them of the consequences of rejecting do you know this message that the mission that these men were being sent on was a vital one? It was a sober responsibility. But Jesus was saying they had to be faithful in that responsibility to share that message. But ultimately, whether people would accept or reject, was, it was not just on their shoulders alone. They were to share that message. And if they were in an area where they got repeated rejection, well, then they, they moved on. The good news was for all to hear. The consequences for rejecting are sober. And so I think when we think of that as well, to know that people are going to a lost eternity, it, it is sobering. It should burden us. It should burden us about family members, about friends, about neighbors. To be faithful to, to pray for them. To be faithful to, to share with them as well. This good news is vital for all to hear. Though Jesus was sending these disciples out initially amongst the Jews, we know the message was going to go wider than that. It was going to go into all the world. You know, when Jesus would ascend to heaven, it would be these very men who would go out into all the world and share that message. But each of us have a responsibility of that as well, don't we? To share of that message. To tell of the universal condition of men that, that this, in this world, if people don't know the Lord, they are sinners separated from God because of their sin. It's essential to talk of the universal condition. It's essential that the people know what God has done, that he sent Jesus to pay the, the price, the ransom for their sin in order to bring them to God. It's essential that they know what they must do. In order to be reconciled to God, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, they must be born again. In order to receive new life from Christ, they must repent from their sin and turn to God and, and trust in Jesus, believe in what Jesus has done through his life, death, and resurrection. And without doing that, there will be no entry into the kingdom of heaven. We live in a world where people, where Satan's deceiving so many, where so many think that you know, maybe it's just a matter of doing good. That's not what the Bible says. Or maybe they think that church attendance is enough. It's not. 
The Bible is very clear. Jesus is the way. He's the only way. You know, but if we are believers here tonight, we have a calling too. These disciples were, were sent out. And we too have a responsibility to share. We have also a responsibility to pray. To pray for the work of missions. To pray that more laborers would be sent out. How the, you know, the fields are waiting to harvest. When you think of it, think of all the, even the new opportunities we have around us as well. But yet we don't have the laborers. We need more laborers, don't we? Continue to pray about that. Don't give up praying about that, but pray believing. Pray to the Lord of the harvest, the one who can answer that prayer. Do you know, may God help us tonight, even as we think about that, because I read an article about the English missionary Henry Martin, and in it it says this, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And it says the nearer we get to him, the nearer we get to Christ, the more intensely missionary we become. May God give us this heart and this burden for lost souls, a burden that we will share with others, a burden that also we will pray to the Lord of the harvest, even that more laborers will come. Let's sing together as we close just now. And it's this hymn, All to Jesus I Surrender. We'll stand as we sing this, please.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the call to mission. And Father, even for the challenge that Jesus brought to these disciples. The, the encouragement to depend on you. And Father, we are reminded, Lord, without you we can do nothing. How we need you even as we do seek to reach out. How we need you as we do seek to even respond with wisdom, even when faced with opportunities to witness. Father, but also the sober reminder, Lord, even of the judgment of, of those who reject you. Father, we do pray maybe even for those in our families who have rejected you. For maybe those who we've tried to share the gospel with and, and yet as, as yet they haven't responded. Father, we do want to give you thanks that you are long-suffering, that you are patient. But Father, we pray that they would not miss that opportunity. Help us as we pray for them, Lord. We do pray for more laborers. Lord, we ask that you would bring laborers along. May they see the challenge. May they see the opportunity. And may they come. Father, also now we ask that you would help us, Lord, even as we meet together just now. We do want to give thanks for these refreshments. And Lord, we ask that you'll not only bless them, but also bless our conversation together. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.